Hi everyone, this lesson is on hepatic encephalopathy. In this lesson, we're going to talk about the proposed pathophysiological mechanisms behind hepatic encephalopathy. We're also going to talk about the signs and symptoms and stages of hepatic encephalopathy, and then we're going to talk about how it's diagnosed and treated. So hepatic encephalopathy is a reversible syndrome involving neuropsychiatric abnormalities in patients with underlying advanced liver disease or underlying cirrhosis. So the key takeaway points here are that it is a reversible syndrome involving neuropsychiatric abnormalities. This is why we call it encephalopathy, pathy meaning disease, and encephalo meaning brain that occurs in patients with advanced liver disease or cirrhosis. And it is an important manifestation of decompensated liver disease or cirrhosis more specifically. And it can occur in liver disease from any etiology, from any cause. And these can include alcohol-related liver disease, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, Wilson's disease, hepatitis B and C, and other conditions as well. So it occurs in patients with end-stage or advanced liver disease, regardless of the cause. It can be any of these causes. Now, it's estimated to occur in up to 30 to 45 percent of patients with cirrhosis, and it may be a presenting finding in patients with newly diagnosed cirrhosis. So in some cases, the patient may not know they have advanced liver disease, and they present with some of these findings we're going to talk about later on in this lesson. And it's going to often be a chronic and recurrent issue, and it can often result in hospitalization. Let's talk about the proposed pathophysiology behind hepatic encephalopathy. So it's important to note that the exact cause is not entirely known. What is known to occur in liver disease, though, is the following. So it's known that there is portosystemic shunting. So portosystemic shunting is where there are abnormal connections of blood supply between the portal vein and the systemic circulation. The portal vein is the vein that draws in blood from the gastrointestinal system to purify the blood before it enters into the systemic circulation. But because of scarring and portal hypertension, we get these abnormal connections occurring between the portal vein and the systemic circulation. So these abnormal connections occur in the portal vein that connect to the systemic circulation before that blood gets to the liver. So that blood essentially bypasses normal liver processing. So the liver is essential and crucial for detoxification of the blood. And because of this portosystemic shunting, we're not going to get that processing or detoxification of the blood like we should. And this is going to be worse in patients who have worse or more severe cases of liver disease. So as the severity of liver disease increases, the portosystemic shunting also increases as well. And then the second important thing that occurs in advanced liver disease is that there is an overall decreased hepatocellular functioning. So hepatocellular functioning is the functioning of the liver cells themselves. So there is an overall decreased hepatocellular functioning in advanced liver disease cases. So even if some of that blood gets to the liver, it's not going to detoxify that blood as much as it should as well. So we're going to get both of these occurring in hepatic encephalopathy. And because of all of this, because of that shunting of blood away from the detoxification in the liver, and because of the decreased hepatocellular functioning, we're going to get increased neurotoxins in the blood. So neurotoxins are going to increase in levels in the systemic circulation. And it is this increase in neurotoxin level in the blood that is believed to cause or eventually lead to brain dysfunction. And there are multiple neurotoxins that have been proposed to result in brain dysfunction, and these include the following. Ammonia. Ammonia is going to be the crucial one here, and this is going to be the one that's most often taught. But there are other neurotoxins that have been proposed to also increase in levels and lead to brain dysfunction as well. And these include mercaptans, short-chain fatty acids, manganese, tyramine, octopamine, and GABA as well. So we're going to focus more on ammonia here as this is believed to be an important one for the pathophysiology, but it's also important to make note that these other neurotoxins, especially when they increase in levels in the systemic circulation, they may also lead to brain dysfunction as well. So let's focus mostly on ammonia here. So what normally happens is that ammonia will come from protein degradation, so it can be from purine metabolism and can also come from gastrointestinal microbiota metabolism of certain nutrients. And what will happen is that ammonia will go to the liver and will enter into the urea cycle. So the urea cycle will convert ammonia into urea. So this is how the body gets rid of ammonia. But in advanced liver disease, this 
your urea cycle is impaired. It's not going to work properly either due to that portosystemic shunting we talked about before where the blood doesn't even get to the liver or because of that overall suppression of hepatocellular functioning. This is going to ultimately lead to increased levels of ammonia in the blood. And then what happens is this increased ammonia in the blood can cross the blood-brain barrier and enter into the brain where we see increased ammonia levels in the brain. And this increased ammonia in the brain can lead to alterations in certain cellular pathways. One of these include the conversion of alpha-ketoglutarate into glutamate. So because we see more ammonia and ammonium ion, this can actually push the reaction or conversion of alpha-ketoglutarate toward glutamate. So this ammonia can be carried by several different amino acids and then be added on to an alpha-ketoglutarate to make glutamate. And then in the process, that glutamate can also be then converted in astrocytes in the brain into glutamine by glutamine synthetase enzyme. So this will utilize an ammonium ion and will convert ATP into ADP. It will consume an ATP. And this will all lead to several different effects, including decreased ATP. As we see, ATP is consumed in this process. We can also see cerebral edema. And this cerebral edema is related to the increased levels of glutamine. Glutamine has osmotic effects to draw in more fluid into the brain. And we can also see oxidative stress because of all this as well. But having said all that, ammonia is not the only culprit here. As we mentioned before, there are multiple other neurotoxins that can lead to brain dysfunction as well. And there have been multiple studies showing that the levels of ammonia do not correlate with the severity of hepatic encephalopathy. So this suggests, again, that ammonia is not the only culprit in hepatic encephalopathy. So now that we know some of the pathophysiology behind this condition, let's talk about some of the risk factors and triggers for hepatic encephalopathy. So one of them is going to be excessive dietary protein. This is going to be a question mark because there is conflicting evidence here. Because of the belief that ammonia plays a role in hepatic encephalopathy and ammonia is a breakdown product of protein metabolism, there have been some suggestions of avoiding dietary protein, but the evidence here is not entirely clear. Another trigger or risk factor for getting hepatic encephalopathy is constipation. So constipation is going to be a reduction in frequency of bowel movements, and bowel movements themselves actually help to excrete ammonia. So because of the decrease in bowel movement frequency, we can see elevations in ammonia levels. We can also see alterations in medication use as a trigger of hepatic encephalopathy. So these can include the use of narcotics or sedatives, but can also be where a patient stops taking their medication for their underlying liver disease. We can also see hypoxia triggering this condition as well, so this is going to be a low oxygen level in the blood. We can also see certain electrolyte disturbances triggering hepatic encephalopathy, so one of them is going to be hypokalemia, so a low potassium level in the blood. And we can also see hypovolemia also being a trigger of hepatic encephalopathy as well. So hypovolemia can come from dehydration or increases in diarrhea or can come from blood loss as well. We can also see renal failure. Renal failure can also trigger hepatic encephalopathy. And certain surgeries and procedures can also trigger hepatic encephalopathy as well or increase the risk of hepatic encephalopathy. One of these surgeries is going to include a TIPS procedure, which is a transjugular intrahepatic portosystemic shunt. So that's essentially shunting away even more blood away from the liver itself. So that's going to increase the likelihood or trigger hepatic encephalopathy. Other surgeries and procedures, including paracentesis, can also trigger hepatic encephalopathy and other types of surgery can also trigger this condition as well. Another risk factor or trigger is worsening liver function. So this may lead to increases in portosystemic shunting or reductions in hepatocellular functioning. So there can be more damage to the liver that could worsen the liver functioning and increase the likelihood of this hepatic encephalopathy occurring. And we can also see this from alcohol consumption as well. And then another important one is internal gastrointestinal bleeding. This actually leads to increases in ammonia levels. And then bacterial peritonitis and other infections can also increase the likelihood of hepatic encephalopathy as well. Now let's talk about the clinical signs and features of hepatic encephalopathy. There are actually four stages of this syndrome. Stage one is going to be the mildest, and it's going to include personality changes, so the patient can have some apathy. They may not care about certain things that they used to care about. Sleep-wake 
cycle reversal may occur as well. So if they are typically somebody that goes to bed at night and wakes up in the morning, they may have issues with sleep and they may start to stay up all night and sleep all day. So there can be these types of reversals occurring. They can also have issues with their short-term memory. So they may start misplacing things that they normally don't. They can also have impaired handwriting and impaired cognition overall. So again, these are going to be mild effects. So they can have mild decreases in their intellect and mild issues with computational ability, some mild confusion, and a bit more slowed speech. So all of these may take place in stage one hepatic encephalopathy. Then we can move into stage two. So if this condition worsens, stage two can occur. And this is when we start to see a clinical sign known as asterixis. Asterixis is where you get the patient to put their arms straight out in front of them, get them to point their hands upward, and get them to close their eyes. And if they have asterixis, what will happen is they will temporarily lose their ability to hold their hand up and their hand will drop, but they will immediately bring their hand back up. So this is what we call a flapping tremor. If you want more information on this, please look up a clinical exam video to see what this actually looks like. So this is believed to be due to some interruption in the brain's ability to maintain this posture. We can also see fatigue and lethargy occurring. So the patient starts to get more tired and worn out and drowsy. They can start to slur their speech a bit in stage two, and they start to become more disinhibited and disoriented, and they can also have a reduction in attention as well. And we can also see an abnormal clock drawing test as well in early stages of hepatic encephalopathy. This is a way to actually screen for hepatic encephalopathy. And what you would do here is that you get the patient to draw a clock, get them to label the clock, and then get them to put the arms of the clock in a position where the time is 10 to 10, for instance. And you could see how they actually do that. And if they're able to do that, that's a pretty good sign that this is not hepatic encephalopathy. And if they have issues with drawing the clock or labeling it or actually putting the arms of the clock in the proper position, that is an abnormal clock drawing test and that could be a sign of hepatic encephalopathy. So I just want to mention that here as an interesting point to make note of. And as the hepatic encephalopathy worsens, we move into stage three. Stage three is when we start to see ataxia. Ataxia is where the patient is unable to properly coordinate bodily movements. And in this stage, we start to see severe confusion. If you were to test their reflexes, they can have hyperreflexia, so hyperactive reflexes. They can also have a positive Babinski sign. So if you were to actually check Babinski sign, they would have a positive Babinski sign where their toes would point upward. And in a normal case, the toes point downward. They often become incoherent as well, and they can have extreme lethargy, but they are still arousable. And then moving into stage four, the patient is in a coma, and we call this coma hepaticum. And some patients may respond only mildly to painful stimuli. Now let's talk about how clinicians diagnose hepatic encephalopathy. The diagnosis of hepatic encephalopathy is often going to be a clinical diagnosis. It's going to be observing those clinical signs we talked about before, those clinical signs of hepatic encephalopathy in the context of a diagnosed late stage or end stage liver disease or a cirrhosis. So we're going to see those signs and symptoms we talked about before. So it could be stage one, two, three, or four of hepatic encephalopathy in a patient who has already had a diagnosis of advanced liver disease. So that's going to be a key point to make note of here is that the diagnosis of the liver disease is already made in these patients. And if it's not, then Oftentimes, it's going to be done by looking at blood work. So liver transaminases, for instance, there can be a biopsy of the liver or there can be an ultrasound of the liver. And it can also be important to exclude other conditions as well. So there may be other conditions that cause similar findings. But again, it's going to be something that we see in patients with advanced liver disease. And then patients with hepatic encephalopathy may have increased serum ammonia levels, but it's often not very helpful in looking at ammonia levels because it's very hard to measure these ammonia levels and they're often not correlated with the stage of the hepatic encephalopathy. An EEG may be used in some cases and what we would see is that patients with hepatic encephalopathy would have diffuse, slow, and high amplitude waves and more importantly the EEG can help rule out seizures. Once hepatic encephalopathy has been diagnosed, how is it treated by clinicians? So it's important to identify and treat the underlying cause. So we talked about all those triggers and risk factors that can lead to hepatic encephalopathy. So it's important to look out for those potential triggers. So once the underlying cause has been identified 
it should be treated. So some of these can include antibiotics. So if it's a bacterial peritonitis, for instance, antibiotics are going to be used. If it is hypokalemia, for instance, potassium supplementation may be used. If it is some medication that is triggering hepatic encephalopathy, it's important to stop the offending agent and so on. So other conditions or other triggers, once they have been identified, it's important to either stop them or treat the condition that is causing the hepatic encephalopathy. So treating the underlying cause and preventing the onset of hepatic encephalopathy is going to be very important here. I mean, ultimately, it's all about reducing neurotoxin levels. So there have been questions as to does limiting protein consumption help to reduce the onset or triggering of hepatic encephalopathy? It's mixed evidence here. Again, as we mentioned before, it may be a trigger in some patients or it may not. So it's still debated whether or not it's helpful to limit protein consumption. Lactulose is going to be very important for patients, and it's important to titrate the amount of lactulose so that the patient has at least two to three bowel movements per day or two to three stools per day, and in some cases up to four stools per day. So it doesn't matter how much the patient's taking as long as they are able to have two to three stools per day. And then in some patients, they may be on rifaximin. So rifaximin is going to be used in some cases, and this is going to be 400 milligrams TID or three times per day. Some other important supportive treatments for patients who have advanced liver disease include zinc supplementation, as patients with advanced liver disease are often going to be deficient in zinc. And then neomycin can be used in some cases, particularly in refractory cases. If other things are not working, neomycin may be used in those cases. And then other supports, depending on the stage or the severity of the hepatic encephalopathy, can include swallow evaluation. So in those later stages of hepatic encephalopathy, like stage three and stage four, the patient may have issues with swallowing, and this can be important to assess in those patients. I hope you found this lesson helpful. If you did, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. And as always, thanks so much for watching and hope to see you next time.